Jeremiah Hansen. And uh, now you're doing an oral presentation at STAPE 2006. You're presenting on diamagnetism to, to overcome gravity then, or? Uh, to replace it, actually. Um, in orbit or in long distance travel to Mars, you're going to be in a low to no gravity field. So the idea was, well, instead of spinning something around at a tremendous speed or you know, having all that rotational inertia, maybe uh, find a different way. And I had seen on Discovery Channel or something like that, they had shown one of the images of levitating a frog in a tube. Oh, sure, sure. Um, pretty much everyone's seen it, but that's pretty much as far as it's gotten. Um, I haven't seen anything on actual practical uses other than rotating frogs and pizza boxes. So, so what, what you're really suggesting then is in a space station, instead of having to rotate the space station, you could use diamagnetism to produce, we're, we're really talking about the, the Star Trek type artificial gravity, right? Well, I don't know if it's Star Trek type. Uh, there are several problems with the concept, such as metal would be attracted towards the magnetic field. So if you have metal, metal feelings, metal eyeglasses, metal implants, that would be a unpleasant experience. That makes Commander Data a complete hoax, because he's, uh, he's all metal. So. <laughs> I think it would melt him, actually. But, uh, but for the most part, uh, want me to wait for a second? Um, so, okay. So anyhow, sorry. So I'm here with Jeremiah Hansen. We're talking about diamagnetism again. And uh, so, so essentially this is for artificial gravity inside of a spacecraft then. This would keep the astronauts playing to the surface? Yeah, diamagnetism is a repulsion of uh, magnetic fields that most matter has. Uh, ferrous and paramagnetic uh, are attracted to it. Ferrous much more than paramagnetic, but it still has uh, uh, an effect. It's just not normally noticed in normal life because magnetic fields are a lot weaker than it would take to provide a substantial force. Um, but they have levitated successfully live frogs and fish. I don't know yeah. fish, but they have levitated live frogs and spiders and strawberries and hazelnuts and so all sorts of little things. big enough field, pretty much anything will levitate though. Yeah, pretty much anything will levitate and the idea was that if you don't have gravity then you're just going to be forced out of that tube. Well, if you're forced out of that tube and um, there's nothing to stop you, you just get shot out like a cannon. Mm, but okay. if you put a plate at the bottom and flip it over, you have the, you know, essentially the same reference frame as you normally have on Earth, but you're not floating around, losing uh, muscle mass and stuff because your legs are still supporting you. Sure. Well, I guess the other thing is that, that this kind of a, that bodes well for the concept is in the case of the frog, um, it didn't interfere with the blood flow at all. That was kind of a concern because there's iron in the blood. But yeah, the uh, I think one of the secrets to that is depending on how you shape the field and, and how big your subject is in the field, you'll end up with uh, it'll be a gradient, but it'll be a minor gradient, so a pretty small gradient in difference. So it should be okay, but a lot more research needs to be done before you uh, actually throw someone in one of these things. Yeah. Um, well, now what about power limitations? That's the problem. Is it takes uh, I think they're running these uh, mice in 10 to 20 Tesla. Yeah, so it's several, a lot of several, several kilowatts. Um, I'm trying to remember the number. I think it's like 30 or something like that. Oh, okay. Uh, some of the papers I read mentioned that uh, take about 40 Tesla and one gigawatt to levitate a person. But you know, you can probably go within 80 percent Earth field and not have a massive osteoporosis problem when you get home. Oh, okay. Um, okay. And your heart mass, heart would lose as much mass and everything like that. You won't, you're not sitting in a centrifuge for 12 hours, spinning around a table, which probably get very disconcerting if your eye patch falls off. So. Sure. Well, now I, I'd like to ask a little bit about your background and kind of experience. You know, are, are you a student right now or? Uh, I graduated in 2001. Oh, okay. Virginia Tech. Uh, oh, awesome. Aerospace engineer. So. Uh, and I just came across the diamagnetism stuff watching Discovery Channel, so... Oh, okay. Or so just kind of idea Discovery. that struck home. And well, I saw it, and I was like, well, if they're levitating a frog, that means the force balance is zero, which means, following Newton, there's a force, and if I use that force to do, since it's a, a body instead of contact force, I can use it in the same way as gravity, and that might work. Sure, sure. No, I think it's a, it's a remarkable idea, and it's something that... Diamagnetism has, has been so well documented, and yet almost nothing has been done with it in terms of applications. So. Yeah, it's, it's considered so weak, it's not really a useful thing, but so is gravity. Well, yeah, so is gravity. So, there you go. It's, uh, I think a lot of the secrets lie in the weak stuff, not the strong stuff. So, 
Well, I guess one thing I should ask is, is kind of your future goals and plans. Are, are you thinking about sticking with this topic for a while or moving uh, on to other ideas? I think for next year I'll work on uh, refining the topic, adding some math, uh, some actual math behind it. And right now it's more of less of a research presentation than an actual calculation. Oh, okay. Um, but I'd like to work on that and with looking at possibly getting some more physics education background. Aerospace engineering doesn't provide a whole lot in the physics realm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very nuts and bolts in some ways. Yeah, and I think there's a, I think that the entire future space-wise doesn't lie in uh, chemical rockets, it lies in physics-based applications of things. Mm, okay. So, uh, to get where we're going to need to go, we need to be able to do it. Otherwise, uh, you know, the most we'll do is Pluto, we won't be able to, you know, if it takes 10,000 years to get to the next solar system, that's an awful long time to wait to see if it actually worked. Yeah, it's really not practical. So. Yeah, I mean, we need we need things on the order of a generation yeah. before it can really become a practical item. Well, thanks again. And again, Jeremiah Hansen. And uh, I, I definitely appreciate your time. And, and no you know, best of luck with the oral presentation. Well, thank you. It's on Thursday if you want to see it.